Greetings and welcome to the Richard Olin Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm glad to be here with you on March 28th, 2023. Uh, I want to talk about USOs for this program. That is water-based UFOs. US, so USOs can often stand for, uh, usually it's a couple of different acronyms there, but it's unidentified submersible objects. Nine times out of 10, that's what uh, the phrases people will use to describe what is a USO. So an under a water-based UFO, essentially. And uh, this is a, a subject that I have been really immersed in, if I can use a, a pun, uh, for about the last year or so. I have collected hundreds of these cases. I can just say on a personal basis, looking into so many of them, it has the definite ability to change your perspective on the UFO subject in general. When you think about it, the earth is covered, 70% of the earth is water, uh, covered by water. We're not normally out on the oceans, right? We, we're, we're land lovers, 99 plus percent of us, we live on the land. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is very big, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, these are huge bodies of water. And most people don't get out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, let's face it, or 100 feet below the surface of the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that's a very rare thing. Uh, you have a few navies uh, in the world, the most, mo most notably the United States Navy, the Russian Navy, uh, back in the older days, the Soviet Navy. They both had a global presence. A few other navies, absolutely. But when you think about that, so if you're a Navy person, you're out in the water and you see a USO or a UFO, you've got classified, you've got protocols to deal with where you're just not going to ordinarily be permitted to talk about it to the world. So most of those stories don't come to us, except very typically when we get them, they are years after the fact, and they are given usually very quietly, uh, a lot of times without the person's name, sometimes with their name, but uh, usually it's many years after the fact. And this is very typical how a USO stories come to us when they're military connected. Uh, now, there are cases where ordinary folks are going to be out on bodies of water, sometimes oceans, uh, sometimes lakes and rivers. And they also will uh, observe these types of phenomena. And we do get those stories as well. One thing that you notice with most USO cases is you don't get a lot of official government documentation to accompany it. Un unlike with a number of UFO cases, where you're looking at a lot of military encounters that come to us through FOIA, Freedom of Information, uh, very few of those, some, but very few are related to USOs. And I just think the main reason for that is there's just fewer of them. We have fewer sightings of these water-based phenomena. And so there's not a whole lot of official government documentation when it comes to USOs. There is some. I'm going to talk about a little bit of it here. But by and large, we're dealing with uh, a much tougher body of evidence. Doesn't mean it's not legitimate. I think it's totally legitimate. But it's a body of evidence that really comes down to a lot of witness testimony, civilians, uh, some military people after the fact talking about this under uh, various restraints, you know, anonymity and so forth frequently. So it's not ideal, but that doesn't mean the phenomenon isn't there. I think we can generally understand why the problem exists as it is in terms of getting the information. We've got a few handicaps here in terms of the way this situation is. So uh, that said, I want to go through some of these USO cases that I have been looking at over the past year. And I can tell you this is a, as long as this program I think will be, you're getting just a sliver, like a real sliver of a massive amount that I've already seen. And uh, beyond that, I, I have no doubt that there are many, many other accounts that I have not yet learned of. But let's just talk about a few of these here. I've got some maps, I've got some images and uh, some uh, bullet points and all of that. So we can start here and uh, let's add this to the stream. So this is the first one that I'm gonna deal with. This is a 1949 case from the Strait of Hormuz. This is a fairly well-known case, at least within the UFO research community. This is, it's not unknown, I should say. And when you look at, uh, where that dot is. So that's one of the key strategic shipping choke points in the world. 
We're going to look at a couple of shipping shipping choke points in the world where USOs take place. This is one of them. This one's from November 14, 1949. Here we are on Google Earth. You can see what I'm talking about. I got the Persian Gulf here to the left. And uh, basically, you're looking at just a 30-mile opening at essentially the narrowest point. A lot of shipping, uh, especially for oil, goes through this area. Well, we are right here in 1949 when uh, a very interesting event happened. A uh, U.S. Navy commander named J.R. Bodler or Bodler is sailing through the Straits of Hormuz, bound for India, is going at a nice leisurely speed of nine knots. So he is uh, on his way out. So to his left would be the nation of Iran. On, that's the position that we've got here. So he, he writes, he's called to the bridge by the third mate who had seen something off to the left side of the ship, slightly in front of them, again, toward the Iranian side of the water. He described it as a pulsating luminous band that resembled the Aurora Borealis except that this was much lower, very near, or possibly on the water. By the way, this is in the evening. I should have mentioned that. So bodler has got binoculars. He's looking at them, and he sees this luminous area was definitely under the water, and it was also approaching his vessel. So at a distance of about a mile, it's becoming very obvious to him that this thing was circular in shape, and it had a, a bright center. He called it a rather ill-defined center, also, streaks of light were coming out like spokes on a wheel. And it was really large. So the diameter of this, he estimated between 1,000 and 1,500 feet, quite substantial. And at this point, he realizes that the as he is getting closer to it, he's noticing that the pulsation effect that he saw is caused actually by the slow rotation of the spokes themselves. And he noticed they were going counterclockwise or anticlockwise in their orientation and this, he said, is what caused the, the bands to seem brighter when they were pointed toward the vessel. So it gave this illusion of a pulsation. Uh, and then to probably his surprise, this thing went right under his ship, right underneath it. And uh, he, he noted, because he wrote about this in some detail after the fact, he said the light uh, from the, this effect was visible all around the ship. It reflected off of the upper portions of the ship. Really quite amazing. He did a, a, a sketch of it. This is what he drew. Quite a remarkable situation, as anyone could imagine. Uh, he writes, it may well, as may well be imagined, the effect was weird and impressive in the extreme, with the vessel seeming to occupy the center of a huge pinwheel whose spokes consisted of phosphorescent luminescence revolving rapidly around the vessel as a hub. So there's a lot of speculation as to uh, what this was. Uh, let me just continue and we'll do the, the rest of this story and then I'll, I'm will i gonna present a few similar cases of this. So the object goes all the way under, comes out on the right side of the ship as it passes uh, underneath them and it travels away at the same speed that it approached. It was very consistent, it appeared once it reappeared on the other side, it was still a pulsat, pulsating band of light. And then they noticed a second object, very similar to the first one, again, ahead of the ship. Almost the same size, a little bit smaller, a little bit less bright. It did not, this one did not pass directly under the ship, but it passed slowly along the right side of the ship. It, apparently they saw it very easily, it had the same pattern of spokes revolving around the center as the first one. And then 30 minutes after this one, they saw a third such object appear. This one was dimmer, smaller than the other two, only about 800 feet or only about 1,000 feet in diameter, still pretty large. Uh, Bodler, I guess he had been spoiled by this point. He said, well, this was unimpressive compared to the other two. I don't know. I think if I were, <laughs> if you hadn't seen any of the others, this probably would have been pretty impressive also. He wondered if this was a natural phosphorescence in the water stimulated by what he called regular waves of energy. This was recounted in the January 1952 edition of the United States Naval Institute Proceedings, and it was later published in Fate magazine and then made, it, made the rounds to the UFO publications. 
So very interesting. There's a lot of speculation. Was this an actual underwater object or objects in this case, or a natural phosphorescence, which does happen in the ocean. Uh, I will just say here, I'll probably come back to this, but uh, I have tried to find, to see whether there's a genuine scientific consensus of this type of phenomenon. And there isn't one. To, to my knowledge, like the best you could find are some scientists speculating that this is some either maybe a bioluminescence, uh, like life forms that can do this, or uh, maybe some under ocean tectonic activity or some kind of geological activity. Seems a little strange to me. It seems like a reach from my perspective. I'm not a geologist. I'm not an expert in these. So I certainly could be wrong. Just seems a little odd to me. And uh, it is quite evident, I think, that no one has really been able to come to any kind of consensus or conclusion about what this is. Uh, I want to show you a couple of other instances of this phenomenon in the exact same area going back to the 19th century that we've been able to capture. Here's one from May 15th, 1879. This is also uh, either at the Strait of Hormuz or in the Persian Gulf, same basic area, something described as a revolving wheel with a center on that bearing and whose spokes were illuminated and looking toward the west. A similar wheel appeared to be revolving, but in the opposite direction, these waves of light extended from the surface well under the water. Uh, this is from 1879. Here's one from 1880. Um, in an, a published letter at that time, he says in May 1880 on a dark night, about 1130 p.m., there suddenly appeared on each side of the ship an enormous luminous wheel whirling round, the spokes of which seemed to brush the ship along. The spokes would be 200 or 300 yards long. So again, about a thousand feet, roughly the same size as what Baudler had described. Each wheel contained about 16 spokes. And although the wheels must have been some 500 or 600 yards in diameter, the spokes could be distinctly seen all the way around. The phosphorescent gleam seemed to glide along flat on the surface of the sea no light being visible in the air above the water. I may mention that the phenomenon was also seen by Captain Avern and this person and that person and so forth. So that's 1880 and that's Persian Gulf. I don't know if that was a Strait of Hormuz, but close enough. Here's another Persian Gulf sighting from 1901. Uh, just have a quick, quick brief statement. There being no phosphorescence in the water, vast shafts of light in the water. Here we have the Gulf of Oman, 1906, that is right next to the Persian Gulf. That's the body of water that leads into the Persian Gulf. So very close, same basic area. This is 1906. Uh, this gentleman writes about shafts of brilliant light which came sweeping across the ship's bow at a prodigious speed, which might be put down to anything between 60 and 200 miles an hour. That's super fast, right, for the water. These light bars were about 20 feet apart and most regular. And that's 1906, Gulf of Oman. Here we are moving now, still early sightings um, to the Strait of Malacca, or not, no, excuse me, that'll be next. This is Malabar, India. You see right here, the west coast of India facing the Arabian Sea, basically the Indian Ocean. Uh, a sighting of tremendous shafts of light right off the coast there. And now here we are in the Strait of Malacca. This is another key shipping choke point, even more so now than back then. But back in 1907, this was still a very important shipping lane. Um, anything from China coming to the rest of the world has got to go through this area, essentially. Uh, so here we are in 1907, hearing about shafts which seemed to move around a center like the spokes of a wheel, which appeared to be about 300 yards long. Again, we're talking about a thousand feet. The size comparison is really quite remarkably consistent along these uh, geographic areas here. Here's another one at Malacca Strait as well from 1909, just two years later. Long arms issuing from the center around which the whole system appeared to rotate. All right, we're clearly talking about a very consistent phenomenon. Here's one from the South China Sea, 1910. Uh, a horizontal wheel turning rapidly. Again, these are phosphorescent or, or luminous bands of water in the ocean. 
So in what what is this phenomenon? I mean, this is just one type of uh, USO effect. Is it a genuine USO? Is this uh, some kind of very bizarre natural phenomenon that we have yet to understand? I don't know. I can't really say. Uh, what we can say is that the phenomenon appears to have a consistency across time and across geographical areas and regions. Uh, there's got to be something that explains this. And one of the things that strikes me is how artificial it seems in terms of its regularity and the kind of well-defined uh, bands that are constantly described here. But again, I'm not going to say I know for sure that these are definitely UF USOs. Don't know that. I wonder. I think it could very well be. Uh, but we're going to leave that. We're going to leave that open for now. Let me uh, go on, and I'm going to show. I've got one or two cases from each of the decades that remain of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So either one or two cases per decade from here on. Again, this is a sliver of some of the kinds of things that we're looking at. This case is from 1955 at the. Titicus Reservoir that is in the state of New York, not too far from where I am currently sitting. Uh, I'm in Rochester, New York. This is uh, the lower por portion of New York State. You can see there's a map on Google Earth where this place is. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a beautiful lake reservoir. And um, so this is, I think this is a great account because the married couple that encountered this were both interviewed at really significant length. They were both assessed to be very impressive individuals by everyone who spoke to them. Uh, these are like sharp people. Uh, I think it's actually really cool that they were out just doing some night fishing. That's what they were doing. So here's the story. The night of September 16th, going into the 17th of 1955, a married couple by the last name of Bordas. They are fishing. This is in the early a.m. So it's after midnight. And as they're out in the boat, they see this uh, rose-colored luminous sphere. They say about the size of a basketball and that it emerged from the water, only a foot above the water, and then it fell back into the water and they both heard a loud splash. Keep in mind, you're at a quiet, dead quiet lake, middle of the night. You're going to hear that, right? Then, toward the center of the lake and apparently floating on the lake, glowed what they said were two parallel lights, like bluish-white fluorescent tubes. They were of a sinuous, wavy shape, but rigid, according to the witnesses, about 30 feet long. Above them was a round, yellowish light. Aha, uh -huh. so what are we looking at here? So they go on. This light was not hovering in midair, but was apparently fixed to a solid body, which was only intermittently visible as a dim gray shape against the blackness. So this thing's under the water, and it apparently is jutting out from under the water. So this is one of these things where you would love to have seen this, because the husband's like, I want to row out toward that. Uh, I don't think his wife was too happy about this decision uh, when you read the transcript of this. But he goes out there. She is now waiting on the shore. And he says, I want to go take a look at this. So uh, without any sound, the lights begin to move off in an easterly direction. They were moving into a stiff wind, apparently, much faster than any rowboat could, could go. And they pointed out that only rowboats were permitted on this reservoir, like no motorboats or anything like that. The lights then stopped and they moved toward the husband in the rowboat slightly. So he, at this point, he rowed back to his wife on the shore. And then together they rowed about a mile toward the boat mooring where uh, they had originally uh like they were parked nearby there. So the whole time the lights seemed to follow them, illuminating their boat and themselves. They could still see the lights as they got into their car to go home. Uh, I put the reference. This was listed in the book Invisible Residence by Ivan T. Sanderson. I think this is written about elsewhere as well. I think I've seen it elsewhere. Anyway, it's interesting case. 
And I don't know what else you can say about it. I mentioned that the couple was interviewed uh, quite extensively. I think it was very evident that the researchers were impressed by their demeanor and the, you know, how they told the story and so forth. So that's that. Let's keep moving on here. I have a couple of Russian or Soviet USO stories. Uh, we can thank uh, Ukrainian-American author Paul Stonehill for gathering most of these together. He's written a number of books on uh, Russian and Soviet era UFOs and USOs. Uh, he noted that th there's a Russian ufology research center that has a lot of files that contain statements of naval officers and intelligence operators and so forth. So I've got, uh, this is one that occurred in the Black Sea. We do not have an exact date sometime during the 1950s. I really like this story though. And so let's go over it. Now, I don't know exactly where in the Black Sea this was. Uh, that other dot is Sevastopol, the naval base there. Of course, this is a very, very geopolitically important area of the world today. But uh, one thing that I you find when you look into these USOs is that the Black Sea area, and also north of it, the Sea of Azov right there, have a uh, apparent history of USO encounters. And to, to the extent that there have been rumors of a, of a base, an underwater base in the Black Sea itself, uh, somewhere between Crimea and the Turkish uh, landmass. So somewhere in the middle there. Is it true? Don't know. But that has been the rumor mill. So this story comes from this gentleman here, uh, Andrei Korsakov. He was, turns out, a very highly internationally respected linguist and a professor at the uh, University at Odessa, the uh, Odessa University, I guess you would say. He also fought in the Second World War uh, for the Soviet Army, fought against the Germans. He was a tough guy, and he had a lot of very good friends high up in the Soviet military, which would not be surprising. Obviously, he fought in the war. After the war, he becomes a professor, but he stays in touch with a lot of his colleagues. So this is coming through Korsakov, and he was speaking to another Soviet researcher at the time by the last name of Krapiva, and it comes from that man. He said, so a friend of Korsakov's. So we're getting the second hand. Okay. Nonetheless, a friend of Korsakov's had been uh, a Soviet naval officer who had served at the Sevastopol naval base. And at some time during the 1950s and in some area of the Black Sea, we do not know where, this officer observed and photographed a UFO or a USO ascend from behind a battle cruiser in the Black Sea. He was under the impression that the object had surfaced from under the water. He didn't see it come from under the water, but apparently he took a photograph. And the crazy thing is that, according to Krapiva, Korsakov himself had a photograph of the object. Where is that photograph today? We do not know where that photograph is today or if it exists anywhere. I don't know, but that is the story. Interesting story. I definitely wanted to share that with you. Here's another Soviet account from the 1960s, August of 1965. We do not have the exact date here from the Red Sea. Let's get into it. This has been reported uh, in many uh, databases. This is not a tough one to find. Uh, deals with the Soviet, Soviet steamship named Raduga. Uh, we don't, don't know where in the Red Sea this was. So I just put the dot right in the middle. It could be anywhere in the Red Sea. Don't know. Uh, what we know is that at about a distance of two miles from the ship, they saw a fiery sphere emerge from under the water and hover over the surface of the sea, clearly illuminating the water, we are told. Uh, it was quite large, about 60 meters in diameter. It's about 200 feet in diameter. Visualize that for a second. That's very, very large. And it hovered above the water fairly low, a distance of about 150 meters or 500 feet above the water. So it's actually really quite large and quite low over the water. They're looking at it from a distance of two miles. And they are seeing a gigantic pillar of water come upward toward the sphere. But only as it came up out of the water. So as it's emerging from the water, it's as if it's pulling up this massive column of water out of the sea. Uh, and then that column collapsed uh, just uh, like a second or two later, apparently. Uh, 
as I mentioned here, this observation was discussed in a number of Soviet publications. I never was able to figure out how the sighting ended. Like, did the sphere uh, fly off somewhere? Did it go back into the water? Did it disappear? We don't know. That is the story. Let's keep going here. Here's another one from the 1960s off the coast of South America from July 20th, 1967. I like this. This is a really interesting case. Uh, here's where approaching it on Google Earth, right off the, uh, I think like about 100 miles off the coast there. And this is the Naviero. This is a, an Argentine ship, uh, part of the Argentine Shipping Lines Company. So they're, I think they're going north. It's shortly before sunset. It's at 6.15 p.m. And the captain and the crew see this, what they describe as a strange shining object. It's, it's bright. It's pacing them in the water for about 15 minutes, not more than 50 feet away to the right of the ship. Again, I would ask you to visualize that. That's very close, very close. You're out in the middle of the water, nothing but ocean, like 100 miles all around, wherever you go, and you've got this thing pacing you. Uh, it was cigar shaped. They estimated to be a little more than 100 feet in length. They noticed powerful blue and white glow to it. No noise, no wake in the water. It's very, I always find these uh, significant. No sign of anything sticking out of this thing at all. It was a totally smooth structure. No periscope, no tower, nothing like that. Uh, the captain said it was actually going at a pretty good clip. Uh, they were going at a speed of 17 knots. This thing was going up to 25 knots. It's still within the range, obviously, of a of an ocean-going vessel, but this was... So we continue here. The craft then suddenly dives under the ship. So it was above the ship. It, it dives under the ship, and it goes right underneath them and vanishes rapidly into the depths, uh, according to the captain, at great speed, whatever that speed is. And they notice it glowing for a while as it goes beneath the water. So this actually made it to the newspapers. The captain says to the press in 20 years, he's never seen anything like it. The chief officer said, this was not a whale. This was not a submarine, at least not any conventional submarine that I've ever known about. He said it looked totally different from either of those. In fact, he said, could not possibly have been either of these things. That's a quote. Uh, this was covered in a number of publications back at the time. So very interesting uh, cases. I w thought about, do I want to talk about the famous Shag Harbor case off uh, in Nova Scotia? A lot of people know about that. I'm not talking about that this time. Uh, maybe we'll come back to it. Uh, I will mention I've discussed these and many, many more of these USO cases on my website at Richard Ola Members. Uh, if you're a member of my site and you're watching this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've done probably about 10 such videos, We've covered a lot of these cases. Uh, and we did a lot, talked a lot about Shag Harbor there. But let's just keep going. Uh, here we are. This is a, another interesting case. This is from 1974. And this is off the coast of Africa, the nation of Togo, by the city of Lome. Uh, March 28, 1974. Here we are zooming in. Uh, Togo doesn't have a lot of coastline, but it's got a little bit of coastline. And that's where we are here. Uh, this is the beach, what it looks like there. It's very nice. And uh, this is where the action happened. Uh, this is an artist's illustration of what occurred. I don't really love this illustration. I think it could have been much better. Uh, this event took place at 1.45 a.m. You've got a couple uh, clearly engaged in romantic shenanigans at some, uh, it's 1.45 in the morning, they're on the beach. Uh, this was actually a, a Frenchman and a, a local from Togo. So they're just hanging out late night on the beach and they see this thing, a cylindrical object approaching them. And so let's go into the case here. So they're on the beach. Uh, they're just getting ready to leave. In fact, it's very late and they hear this high-pitched whine or whistle sound. It's actually painful uh, to their ears. And they see this unlighted cylindrical object just above the water. Okay, so now, and they see that it's coming toward them on a level flight path, and it gets to within 500 feet of them. And then it stops. And at that point, 
the two experienced, uh, well, I guess what you can only call a tidal wave that slams into them. In fact, it's so intense that uh, the, the man who described this, I think a year or two later to a French UFO researcher, he said, I actually had to hang on to a, a tree here. I'm holding on to the tree and I'm holding on to my uh, date <laughs> um, so that we did not get washed out to shore. That apparently is how intense this was. Uh, and at that point, this object is shooting beams of light at them at the same time. This has got to be an insane situation. So he, uh, and the, the other thing about this is that the water below this object uh, was, uh, the effect was it was created this well below the object. It was like this trough, uh, this opening in the water where it just uh, was a, like this deep bell shaped water. You know, the water just goes way, way down, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. And uh, presumably you can imagine this object, if it's pushing the water out of the way, uh, could that have caused the, the water to rush upon them this way? You can only wonder. Uh, I will mention before I continue with this case, the late Carl Feind, who in my opinion was the greatest of all USO researchers, bar none. Carl Feind um, died a little less than 10 years ago. He wrote a book called Water UFO, which I strongly recommend. And until recently, um, there was his website was up too. It's no longer available, unfortunately, waterufo.net, where he uh, collected massive numbers of water-based UFO in, in, um, encounters that were on his website. Uh, you can use the Wayback Machine, maybe uh, find some of the cases there. It's not fully complete, but it's better than nothing. Uh, if, if you were lucky enough to do a website rip of it or a mirror of the site, then you're in luck. But uh, anyway, Carl Feint did an analysis of this case. And one thing that Carl was uh, really, really great at doing, in my opinion, was trying to understand the scientific effects on water of these, these objects. He had a lot to say about it. Uh, in any case, he believed that this is actually quite consistent with a lot of effects of UFOs on water, where they're creating a field around themselves and this has the definite effect Whereas if it's above the water, it will depress that water. If it's below the water, it will often create a kind of uh, mound, a water mound above it. Um, anyway, I would recommend uh, Water UFO, the book. It's a, a very, very excellent book. So anyway, the man seeing the water being affected in this matter, they are apparently feeling some kind of paralysis. This whole thing goes on for 20 minutes, which is almost extraordinary for me to even imagine. But... After 20 minutes, the object finally turns off its lights and flies off over the sea. I sometimes wonder, were they abducted? But did something happen? I, there's no indication that that's the case, but 20 minutes just seems like an ungodly long period of time to go through this type of experience. Uh, the water then returns to normal. Uh, the man for the next few days feels exhausted. He feels like he's about to faint. There's a ringing in his ears. And the other thing that I'll just mention about this case is I mean, it seems like an extraordinary incident. The woman was never interviewed. And the reason for this is that his account became known when he was back in France, I think about a year and a half later. And he meets a UFO researcher by the last name of Maynard, I believe, who did a very thorough interview with him and wrote up a long article about this. Uh, in Maynard's opinion, uh, this witness had no desire for publicity on this. He didn't have an agenda to speak of. That was, you know, he just, and, and he didn't really try to extrapolate on what he thinks this was. Uh, according to the interview, we, this witness was very factual and really gave no reason uh, for anyone to disbelieve his story. So that's, that's what we have. Often with USO cases, this is as good as you get. But, you know, you have to ask yourself, if, if it doesn't, um, reach the level of scientific proof that you could develop in laboratory conditions, do you therefore just pretend it never happened and discard it? Or do we do the hard work and try to puzzle it out and think what could have happened here? Uh, and I think that's a much more interesting endeavor and, and more useful. And that's what we're doing here. So let me continue. Uh, Gibraltar, another shipping choke point, obviously. And I've got two in a row from Gibraltar I'm going to share. This one is from just two weeks after the, the Togo case, 
uh, middle of June 1974. What happens here? This is now Gibraltar. You can see this is only 10 miles from the coast of southern Spain with North Africa. And uh, that yellow dash uh, where ferry. Today, you can take a ferry from Algeciras to Ceuta and back. You can do that 50 plus years ago as well. There are all these ferry services going back and forth. Uh, only over a 10 mile distance. So it's nice. Tourists love to do it. And that's what was happening here in June of 1974. Now, I don't know where along this 10 mile stretch this happened, or was it going south or going north? Do, do not know. But what we do know is that this account was listed in a US Defense Intelligence Agency report. Uh, I think it was possibly originally reported in the local newspaper. And all we have is this statement here. So you had uh, witnesses on the ferry, they're between the two seaports, and in the words of the U.S. Uh, intelligence report, round, intense, torch-like light rose out of the water near a huge rock, traveled at low altitude, then fell again, or fell into the water again. This happened twice. So that's pretty darn interesting. You think about this. You're in a ferry. You see this thing come uh, a torch-like or a luminous object coming out of the water, traveling over the water, and then dropping back into the water, and then doing it again. That's what we see. So what does that? Your guess is as good as mine. Here's another one from Gibraltar from almost exactly 10 years later, June of 1984. Uh, we don't have the exact date. This is a Soviet case. Really interesting. And it's just off, it's about, uh, I think, 20 miles east of the strait, but you can see pretty darn close to the other one from just 10 years earlier. Let's get into it. This is a very detailed event. And again, you know, with this, the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, a lot of these cases were finally discussed, and this is one of those. So we have a seaman by the name of Alexander Globa from the Soviet tanker Gori, and they're in the Mediterranean. They're just 20 miles east of Gibraltar, 600 hours, 1600 hours. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. He's on duty with his second in command by the name of Bolotov. Both of them see what they call as a strange polychromatic object. So, uh, you know, various colors, right? It's moving toward the rear of their ship and then it stops. Bolotov is observing it. He's got binoculars and he's getting excited. It's a UFO. It's a flying saucer. My God, hurry. And so Globa has his own binoculars and he's looking at the same thing and he sees it's metallic. It's reflective. It resembles, we called it an upside down frying pan. The lower part of the craft was larger than the top half. Um, and yes, that's right. Smaller was on top. And he said it was around and about 20 meters in diameter, about 65 or 70 feet in diameter. Pretty typical size of a lot of UFOs. Uh, this consisted of two half disks, and they're rotating in opposite directions. Around the lower disk were many shining bright bead-like lights. And he said the bottom part appeared completely even and smooth, yellow or amber colored easily visible, he says. At the edge of the bottom was something that looked like a pipe, interesting, that glowed like a very bright reddish neon lamp. Uh, oh yeah, and he said the top of the disc had a triangular shaped object on it, whatever that might be. Suddenly, he says that this object jumps up several times as if moved by an invisible wave. The crew of the ship are trying to get us attention by using a signal projector, like they're shining a light at it, I'm thinking, something like this. Uh, by now, the ship's captain is on deck. He's got his guys. His name was Sokol Sokolovki. And the object now moves toward another ship, which was an Arab ship, a dry cargo ship, and it hovers over that ship. And then 90 Seconds later, it drifts over to one side and then gains speed and shoots off. This object was not seen in the water, but I wanted to include it. Just it's, It was low over the water, and I just thought, you know what? Good enough. <laughs> so they are observing that when it rose through the clouds, 
it appeared and disappeared again. It would shine in the in the sunlight, and then it flared up like a spark. He said, and it was gone. And uh, this was published in a, um, a publication out of Odessa. Paul Stonehill got a copy of it, and it made it to Filer's Files, which I think is how I probably first saw this. So uh, that was the one case that I'm describing here that was not actually observed to be in the body of water, or at least probably in the water. So now let's go to the Channel Islands. Uh, you couldn't do a USO show without at least talking about this area. Uh, this is a long time USO hotspot. We're talking off the coast of Los Angeles, Long Beach, Santa Barbara, uh, you know, uh, Catalina Island and, and a variety of other islands in that area. Here they are, Santa Cruz Island, um, San Clemente and a few others I did not indicate here. Um, Palos Verdes on the shore. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. So there's many uh, confirmed USO cases. This one, I don't even have an exact date for it, but I elected to include it because I really like this case. I want to share it with you. I think it's important for several reasons. So there's uh, Palos Verdes, Rancho Palos Verdes on the north there and Catalina Island. And this is kind of where the action is occurring. And there's a, a, a lighthouse there. And that's where this in these individuals were. So this was, uh, actually, let me just uh, describe this before I get into it. So this was written about in a number of places. It was written, it was uh, uh, sent off to MUFON. It was, uh, it ended up in Filer's files. George Filer has for years collects UFO stories. It came there. And it was also written about in a fictional contest context by the same person in a series of articles in 1998 in UFO magazine called the Sedge Masters Articles. I've talked a lot about these on my website at Rich Hill and Members. I think that this is a very important series of articles. These articles or the, the account, I think, of this very well may have been told to Admiral Thomas Wilson by Dr. Eric Davis in the Davis Wilson Notes. The author of this account, Jeffrey Griffith, is mentioned in the Davis notes of his meeting with Thomas Wilson. Uh, Griffith wrote in the UFO magazine under a pseudonym, but he used his actual name with uh, George Filer and in the MUFON journal as well. So this is really interesting. So he writes about it in UFO magazine, but and and also explicitly for George Filer. So what he said, he's kind of cagey here too. He says, two friends of mine were driving in a convertible along Palos Verdes Drive. I suspect he was one of those two friends. But anyway, uh, they saw a large glowing light moving very swiftly underwater from east of Santa uh, Catalina Island coming towards them. And this is not the only time I've ever heard of this type of thing. You get a lot of cases where objects are, or underwater objects are seen coming from Catalina Island toward the coast, just saying. Anyway, so they're watching this light surge toward the cliffs below them. Because in the Pacific coast, it just drops off, right? Very sheer cliffs there. And so it's coming close enough. And when it gets so close, the, their view is blocked by the cliffs. That makes sense. Suddenly what they saw was this bright UFO flying over the cliff's edge over their heads and up there is a ravine apparently uh, near them cut into the steep slope of the mountain and it goes off toward that area. So they get excited and they chase after it. They've got a nice little convertible sports car. They're speeding up the road, going after it. They go off the road for a while, as long as they can go. And then they get out of their car and proceed on foot to go up this hill toward there's a bunch of homes up there. And they are then abruptly stopped by someone who's dressed like a police officer in what uh, Griffith said was this odd uniform uh, and a police car that seemed very odd to him as well. You know, that's all we can say there. And this guy is saying, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we're following this amazing UFO. And he's like, you're on private property. You're trespassing. You have to leave now. And they do leave. And that's essentially that encounter. He, he did add a couple of weeks later in the same area that his friends, whoever they were, were paced by a shiny metallic, metallic disc 
for some distance before it took off into the night sky. There's an image out of UFO magazine illustrated. This uh, kind of shows the scene. It's not accurately done because uh, it doesn't really show the cliff. I mean, you can see the water here and in the background, and that is not how this was. They were on a high cliff when they were being shuttered off by the police officer. But now the thing about this case uh, that makes it interesting to me is Jeffrey Griffith was a, as a lawyer. He's still around. He's still alive. He's a lawyer. And his friend was a woman by the name of Mary Elizabeth Elliott. I've talked about her uh, recently on this program, not, not long ago. And as a matter of fact, uh, they have their own interesting story that appears in, the, I think the Davis notes refer possibly to her um, engagement as an employee of TRW with some kind of UFO group known as Zodiac. This is what it looks like. So they Davis may have told Wilson about that, or he may have told Wilson about this USO encounter, or maybe both. But if you read those notes carefully, it's very evident that Davis was speaking to Wilson about something to do with Jeffrey Griffith, this man who is writing about that interesting USO encounter. Uh, he never gave a date. He was very, very cagey about when this happened. It could have been in the mid-90s. It could have been earlier. Could have been in the 1980s, for all we know. Could have been even in the 70s. He doesn't really say. So it's all guesswork, but I just think it's a fascinating case. And there are many, many USO cases from that exact region, quite a few, that are explicitly, you know, the dates, the witnesses are all very well known. So there's a lot of activity going on in that region. We will continue. We're going to move into the 21st century now. This is a case I have always been enamored of this case. This is in Nova Scotia at a place called Cape Breton on the north uh, northeastern part of the island. Uh, this is an image of it. This is, <clears throat> I pulled this, I think that of Filer's Files. There's an object coming out of the water. I will emphasize to anyone who's not sure that is Photoshop. This is not an actual photograph of an object coming out of the water. That I think is Cape Breton, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a cool photograph. And maybe what happened is very similar to this because what we're going to see is a triangular object was said to come out. Though not, it was a little darker. It was like dusk when this happened. But let's let's go into it. So this is February 16th. 2008, you know, not ancient history. This is uh, on Google Earth. You can see the northeastern part of Nova Scotia. Here we are at a place called the English Town Ferry. So uh, I really I tried to study this as well as I could to get a sense of where the witnesses were and where this object were. And I do think this is pretty close to where it was. This case was originally sent to a gentleman named Brian Vike. Uh, who was a very active Canadian researcher for the first decade of this century. And also, I think in the late 90s, if I'm not mistaken, he took a lot of UFO reports, many Canadian reports, a number of American reports as well. And uh, this is a really neat one. So this was reported initially to Brian Bike, and then it made its way to George Filer. I'm going to read this to you. This is what the people wrote directly. We had pulled over to check the trailer hitch about half a kilometer south of the English town ferry on the east side of Kelly's Mountain on February 16th, 2008. A large triangle shape with a bluish glow came out of the water about one kilometer away at 6.15 p.m. Uh, I checked when sunset was in this area at that time. And I think, uh, God, I cannot remember. I think like the sun had just set. So it was, it was somewhat dark. It wasn't super dark. It was getting dark. So they see a large triangle come out. It hovered above the water for 10 seconds and then went straight up. And then they write, we are now looking up at it. And I'll just point out in early 2008, the iPhone capability easily had web connectivity at that time. This was totally possible to... Uh, you get a cell phone connection, and these people very easily could have gone to Brian Vike's website through their phone and wrote this up. It would not been a problem whatsoever. And so I think it's kind of cool. They're like, we're now looking up at it. it <clears throat> excuse me. It's about 3,000 feet in the air. 
and we figure it's about 200 feet long and about 75 feet wide. <laughs> this is really extraordinary. Two more just like it came out of the water in the same area and did the same thing as the first, and there are now three. They started going higher, almost straight up, and then looked like they became one or were flying very close together. Either way, it started to go north and started to look like a star in the sky. It got somewhat brighter and disappeared about 80 miles north of us within one minute. Uh, some of this is past tense. Some of this is present tense. They got a little mixed up there. But, you know, you get the sense that they're writing this pretty much at the time. And then after it went away, they may have finished up writing the report. That's my take on it. A really remarkable uh, event. Did it really happen? Well, you know, again, we're, we're stuck with the, the fact that so many of these cases were not, uh, there, there was not sufficient follow-up. You did not get investigators to interview these people. And it's one of two things in my case. It's, they either accurately saw this or they were just totally hoaxing. Uh, I don't think there's an in-between for this particular case. And I guess my instinct's going to be that I think they were telling the truth. You may disagree. Fair enough. Uh, I'm just giving you my opinion here. And there are two more that I've got. Uh, this one's from 2017, Gulf of Mexico, another, uh, we could say, hot spot of USO activity, along with the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean Sea or Caribbean Sea, um, which I don't have any sightings from the Caribbean Sea proper on this one, on this presentation, but there are many, many, many. But this is from the Gulf of Mexico, and this is a really interesting one. This was sent to the National UFO Reporting Center run by Peter Davenport, and in this instance, Peter spoke at length with the witness, found him to be very credible, so I'm including it here. So this is about 80 miles off the coast and uh, in the Gulf, and uh, this, these are some highlights. I'll read the report. This is witnessed by the crew of an offshore supply vessel 80 miles off the coast of Louisiana just before dusk. A lot of these cases you find, uh, not all of them, but quite a number, it's either the sun is setting or it's close to setting. And this is another of these cases. Uh, this was, report was submitted by the chief engineer who saw this with four other crew members. The object emerged from the water. It was five times the size of their vessel. They estimated this thing to be well over a thousand feet long, really big. So this is what he writes. I'm going to read it to you. Close to 7 p.m. on March 21st, this is 2017, just before dusk, myself and four of the crew members aboard our vessel saw a craft that appeared to be five times our 240 foot vessel in length. My line of sight was about a quarter of a mile from our vessel. I think he's saying this object was a quarter of a mile away from him. That's how I'm reading that, not sure though. There was a rig behind the craft about a half a mile. So this, by that, you would think this object was between his, his ship and this other ship. He said, I used this to help gauge the size of the craft. Sighting was approximately 80 miles southeast of New Orleans, Louisiana. The scene lasted about 40 seconds. The craft rose up out of the water, the Gulf of Mexico, about 40 feet. No water was dripping from the craft. Within a split second, the craft disappeared at a 30 degree angle into the sky. Speed appeared to be faster than the speed of a light turning on in a room. That's almost as fast as Muhammad Ali. I think he said, uh, I'm so fast. <laughs> what did Ali say? I'm so fast. When I turn the light off, I'm in bed before the light goes off. <laughs> Something like that. Remember that? Boxing fans? Anyway, this is super fast. This thing takes off. So uh, he says, within seconds, it had disappeared completely. I can say for sure that the craft was dark colored oval in shape and made no sound whatsoever. With as many rigs, two, there has to be more witnesses than just the four on our vessel. And I'll just read to you what Peter Davenport himself said about this. Peter runs the National UFO Reporting Center, of course. And what he has always done is when he gets a particularly interesting or intriguing sighting, he will speak to the witness. He did so in this case. And Peter writes, 
We spoke via telephone with this witness, and he seemed to us to be unusually sober-minded. We suspect that he is a very capable and very reliable witness. He estimates that upwards of perhaps 50 people who were aboard nearby vessels may have witnessed the event as well. We would urge those other witnesses to submit reports of what they witnessed. And uh, it's on the New Fork site as well as a few other places there. And I've got one more case I want to discuss with you. This one actually did get a fair amount of publicity quite recently. This was leaked, a video to uh, filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. It's off the coast of San Diego, July 15th, 2019. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will recognize this image. Uh, this was covered on Mystery Wire. That's George Knapp's uh, website. This object is seen. Uh, I think this is the USS Omaha, and they're watching it on infrared, and it goes into the water. So um, just July 15, 2019, this was on all social media. It shows a spherical object maneuvering above the water off San Diego. It appears to descend into the ocean, and you hear people saying, it splashed, it splashed. Uh, they searched for wreckage, did not find anything. So interesting, and, you know, I just, I'm, I'm fascinated by these cases. They're for, the, the ones that I've selected, these are from around the world. And only recently have we gotten anything like what we can call an official confirmation of the reality of this. And I'm going to just relay this. This was uh, from the uh, website Debrief, the Debrief. They cover a lot of this type of phenomena, of course. And I'll just point out to you, this is from December 2nd, 2020, not long ago, a senior member of the intelligence community, it's according to the debrief, whose responsibilities for decades involved underwater surveillance and reconnaissance programs, told the debrief that there was validity to claims of extremely fast moving underwater objects being detected by US military systems. He says, on one occasion, there are detections made of non-cavitational, that means objects that do not cause a wake, like they're not making a ruckus under the water, non-cavitational, extremely fast-moving objects within the ocean. Wow. Goes on, the intelligence official declined to elaborate further, citing the high levels of security classification. Yeah, no kidding, associated with underwater reconnaissance. Officials who had read the reports say the... Uh, uh, UAP task force, uh, as it was called back then, appears particularly interested in transmedium vehicles. Uh, these, of course, are vehicles that can operate in the water or out of the water equally well, or for that matter, in uh, in space. These are three different mediums. Uh, for the purpose of USOs, when you hear transmedium, we're usually thinking water and the atmosphere. And indeed, you think about how difficult that is to do. We There are no officially bona fide transmedium vehicles. And I, I talked with a few folks, both on my website, uh, some members of the site who know these things really well, and elsewhere. And the it's a serious problem of physics and engineering to get something to do that. But the UAP task force was quite interested in that. No kidding. So, you know, what, what we are dealing with here. I mean, this is very, very significant stuff as you don't need me to tell you. All you needed was someone to show you the cases and you're easily able to look at these and think, wow. Uh, and this is only a sliver, uh, the tiniest sliver of the data that we have. And that's the, that's the fact. Uh, clearly, there is not enough recognition of this phenomenon. Clearly not enough. Uh, you know, we we're, we live on land. This is water-based, ocean-based. Most of the times, we're not even available to see it. On the occasions that we are out there, we do, once in a while, we encounter this. There's still obviously something happening. And yet here we are in our society, at least publicly, we're still debating if these things are even real or are they really extraordinary or is it something that is more mundane and explainable? But let me ask you, you know, to, to consider if they, how do we put this? Is this what it looks like? Because what it looks like is that we have a very advanced intelligence operating in our oceans, 
not really trying to get our attention, it seems to me, at least most of the time, maybe some of the time they were, but a lot of the time they're just, they seem to be doing what they do. Um, on occasion, showing an intense interest in people like that, uh, the case off the, at the beaches of Togo was one example. But there are other cases where they do seem to be interested in the, the people who are observing them. But, you know, here we are in our society. We're asking, is this real? What can we do about this? What's going on? And there appears to be a phenomenon that is able to operate at great ease in the depths of all of the bodies of water of this planet of ours. And what are they doing in these bodies of water? I mean, I've been wondering this for years and I don't have a perfect answer. Are they studying our oceans? Quite possible. Are they studying uh, the marine life of the oceans? Totally possible. Do they have bases under the ocean floor or inside an ocean mountain? I would say that is totally possible. There have been rumors for years and years of such uh, activity. <clears throat> One uh, series of events I did not uh, mention here uh, were off the coast of Venezuela. I'm trying to recall, I think 19, early 1970s, 72, I was just looking at these cases and for a, a fairly extended period of time, um, north of Caracas uh, off into the Caribbean Sea there, uh, for a long period of time, people were seeing uh, objects going into the water, coming out of the water on multiple occasions. Uh, this got a lot of local newspaper coverage. It's just one example. There, This has gone on many, many times in many regions over the years. Is there a base in some of these places? Uh, I've, you know, I've mentioned the rumors of a base in the Black Sea. There's rumors of a base off the uh, uh, western coast of France, I believe. And then you've got rumors of a base in the Caribbean or of a base uh, possibly in the Puerto Rico Trench, which we did not discuss that here. Uh, it's an extremely deep uh, trench. Uh, it's deeper than Mount Everest is high. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of very strange activity going on there. Rumors of a base uh, near Catalina Island. Uh, the author, UFO researcher Preston Dennett, said a whole book on that entire possibility. So we've got uh, rumors of bases. And then there's actually rumors of bases off the coast of Japan. So all of these could be true. We we just, we're dealing with a phenomenon that is very substantial and appears to be entirely covert. And, you know, I have to think this is a very significant part of the UFO phenomenon itself. I could speculate more, but, you know, this is something that we've, we've all speculated about many times. I've done it many times. I don't need to go into all the, all the speculations again here, but obviously something important is happening in the bodies of water of this planet. And I think we, uh, for those of us who are interested in the UFO subject, would do very well to remember that, you know, there's more to the UFO subject than asking, is the government going to give us disclosure? <laughs> There's a very substantial phenomenon that is going on around the world all the time. It's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And it is a global phenomenon that involves what seems to be an incredibly impressive, highly technologically advanced uh, group or groups that are able to operate here seemingly with no problem. So on that note, I will leave you. And I'm uh, very grateful that you uh, were able to hang out here with me. Uh, as always, I will just say, if you like what you see here, please do hit the like button, subscribe to my channel. It doesn't cost anything. It does help me out. And uh, hit notifications so you don't miss when I release a new video. If you really like what I do, go to my website, richardolamembers.com, where I do this type of research uh, every week, all the time, multiple times a week. And that's all I've got for you. So again, thank you for being here with me. Let us keep fighting the good fight. I will catch you all again soon. Later.